Great. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. We are going to have a fantastic event for you this evening. Well, they all are, aren't they? But first of all, something not so fantastic. My name is is done, and I'm chairman of two great groups in the BCS, the Central London and North London branches. Loads of great colleagues, I'm really privileged to be. If you're not part of the BCS, big encouragement from you, please join. Now, there are two funny fellows involved in this first few minutes of this session. I am one of them, and I'm an FBCS, a fellow of the BCS. And so is our guest tonight. Peter Wood, he's a fellow of the BCS as well. He's a funny fellow too, and you'll find out more about that pretty soon. Well, we are very pr privileged to have some great presenters for you, as you know. And you've seen many of them already, I think, and Peter's going to be another one. Now, in, in terms of Pete, well, he has done so many things. He is really a man who is multi-talented. And if you, uh, want to know what sort of things he's done? Well, please read the things which are on the screen. And in addition to that, I'm going to tell you, he's also a racing car driver. He has greyhounds. Presumably he chases after them as opposed to running with them. And he does something else as well. You, you may be able to hear some music through my rather distorted speakers here. Guess what? That's Pete's group, Ghost Brain. And this is Pete playing Flying Mane. Now, in terms of Flying Mane, as you can see, my mane has flown some time ago. So in fact, as most of Pete's, but we were very lucky to be able to dive into the stable after the horse had bolted. And lurking in a corner there, I found Mr. Peter Wood. Pete, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Darlene. What a wonderful introduction. <laughs> you're, you're too kind, sir. Much too kind. Um, I'm just going to see if I can get my screen share to work properly. And there we are. How's that? Yep. Super. All righty. Um, I haven't got quite enough screens on this desktop, I don't think. I'm, uh, I'm looking at at least two screens and my own face has disappeared. So that's a great relief. So, that's why you've got a squint. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get going, shall we? Thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. I've been uh, looking forward to this uh, for uh, a, a long time. I've put uh, quite a lot of time into sorting through my history and decided the right way to uh, to present this to you was in the form of uh, a sort of light-hearted look back over the first 30 years of my career. So as, uh, as Darlene mentioned, uh, let's see if I can, oh yes, okay. So I've been, uh, I've been a fellow, a very proud fellow of the BCS for a number of years. Um, I'm also a CITP. And uh, as you can tell from that, a big supporter of the BCS too. Um, I'm currently uh, employed part time at uh, a company called Naturally Cyber LLP, but we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm also, as Darlene said, uh, an enthusiastic uh, motorsport driver and also a, a, a semi professional musician, although heaven knows, um, I'm not sure how many people attending this webinar would appreciate that, but we'll see. Anyway, let's start at the beginning. The first few slides represent the uh, history of computing before I got started. This one, um, you'll see this is a very pictorial presentation, by the way. I've put it together primarily with pictures rather than words because everybody tells you that's what you should do with PowerPoint. And for this presentation, it seemed the, uh, the most appropriate approach as well. So on this first slide, uh, in case you're unsure, I'm the person on the right. Um, that's me um, in uh, late 1953, I believe. And on the left is uh, a concurrent computer. And uh, 
it's something, a picture I've used a lot during my career in, in cybersecurity to uh, demonstrate to people how it is possible to make a computer unhackable. And in this picture, um, my standard statement would be this. You're looking at something that isn't connected to any other computer that looks incredibly difficult to program. And you're probably looking at the only two people who know how to use it. But on a serious front, way back in 1953, IBM was selling model 701s. They actually sold 19 of them uh, to research labs, to, to airplane companies, and also to the government. And a chap called Arthur Samuels used that 701 to write the first computer program designed to play checkers. Um, checkers is about my limit. I'm not a chess player, I have to say, but we in the UK might call it drafts. Anyway, um, the reference to aircraft companies will come back in a little while. Moving forward a bit to 1961, um, again, I'm the person on the right. Um, I look a lot cuter than I probably was, I think. That's quite a disturbing photograph, really. Um, I don't still have a parrot, by the way. That was just loaned to me. Um, the relevance on the computing front was the, uh, the 1401, which uh, was the first transistor computer that uh, the IBM started shipping way back in 61. And by the mid 60s, nearly half of all the computers in the world were IBM 1401s. Interesting stuff, at least to me. By 1964, they built the System 360. And I wanted to mention this because later, as we approach elements that I actually worked on, a lot of the systems were based on the uh, 3270 protocols that came into play with the System 370, I guess. Interestingly, they invested $5 billion in 1964. That's a great deal of money, isn't it? And they were, they were selling up to a 1,000 a month of the uh, good old system 360s. I note that uh, in uh, 21st century view, this photograph has uh, some pluses and minuses. At least it's gender balanced, but um, I'm not sure who has the more important job, the chap at the teletype or the lady with the uh, tape load, but at least they were gender balanced even in 64. And uh, also in 64, it just made the transition to, to ICs and uh, its major source of revenue began to move from punch cards to electronics. So this is the, the world I grew up in as a child. That's why I'm showing these pictures, really. Come 1966, I was doing things I probably shouldn't have been doing, which was playing with the UK phone network. And for the younger, younger people amongst you, um, you can see on the left, a nice cutaway drawing of, uh, of a, a GPO phone box, and on the right, what it looked like inside in more detail. Um, those of us that remember putting a two pence piece in, and when you get connected, you press button B, and your two pence piece is swallowed up, and you have a phone call, um, or it's A, I beg your pardon for answer, and B if you don't get through and you get your money back. That was um, something I, I was obsessed with playing with because, of course, it used the loop disconnect system rather than uh, multi-frequency dialing the uh, touch time. And that meant that it was done on clicks. So I was obsessed with holding the handset up and pressing the, the, uh, the handset rest uh, to, to generate the clicks rather than using the dial just to see what worked and what didn't. And I think for anybody who's worked in, uh, in security, especially from a penetration testing point of view, it's quite interesting to, to note that lots and lots of them are people who want to know how things work. That was my first experimentation. Um, I remember also that uh, a GPO engineer came around one time to our house a bit later, and that's where I discovered that they had special numbers that they rang to achieve things like a line test and a ring back. And of course, I became obsessed with playing with that as well. Just before I started work, um, this thing came into play, the Apollo guidance computer. And I had to include this because honestly, 1969 wasn't just the year that I started work. It was also the year of the moon landing. And um, a lot of my, my activities in the uh, nine, early 70s and then during the 80s was in real world computing, physically connected computing, uh, you know, data acquisition, process control, that sort of stuff. 
And of course, the, uh, the Apollo guidance computer fits into that category pretty, uh, pretty well. In case you've ever wondered how to program one of these, um, it says here, and this is lifted off the NASA site, that the astronauts are responsible for entering more than 10,000 commands for each trip between the Earth and the Moon, and they had to do that by entering two-digit codes from that, from that little keypad. So that's some serious data entry activity there. All right, so here's the first computer I actually got my hands on. This was uh, in 1971. I'd been working for two years and I worked for a company called Computing Techniques. Um, they were based in Billingshurst in West Sussex, which is also where I lived. And in fact, their factory and office was uh, about half a mile from my house. So it was for me the, the second job I had and the perfect one as far as commuting was concerned. I could even go home for lunch. And the systems that I worked on there included the Vidac 336. That's, that photo there actually comes from um, an eBay listing, I believe, where I actually found a 336 for sale, but it was little more than I was prepared to fork out for just for uh, that sort of nostalgia, if you will. It's an analog digital hybrid computer, and it was used primarily in science and engineering. And probably for me at that age, um, as you can see, I was uh, as respectable then as I am now. Uh, the most important thing was in the evenings, we could turn it into a synthesizer. And a little like a Moog synthesizer, you could use the, uh, the integrators and so on to create some really interesting sounds. And I think way back then, that's when I first got interested in electronic music, which is something I still play with today. So not just a useful scientific device, but also uh, an electronic music generator. By the mid 70s, I'd moved on to digital computing and I worked for a company called Redifon based in Crawley in West Sussex. Um, at the time, there were three Redifon companies. I worked for Redifon Computers Limited. There was Redifon Simulation that became Rediffusion Simulation much later in life. And there was Redifon Radar which worked for uh, systems for the Navy. So my division, which was ready from computers, was nothing to do with flight sims. It was a purely digital system based around the DG Nova mini computer. And this was used uh, primarily for key to disk systems. Um, for example, uh, I know that ICI Paints bought one and uh, a number of banks did too. Um, I guess uh, my claim to fame was that uh, I got uh, dumped with the task of helping these to be installed in Warsaw in Poland uh, during 19, 1976 and 1977. Now you can see my passport photograph from 1976 there on the bottom right. And uh, that's what I look like, um, getting on a plane for the first time in my life and uh, flying outside the UK, therefore going outside the UK, for the first time in my life, I landed at Warsaw Airport in 1976 to be greeted by men in uniforms carrying submachine guns and, uh, and handguns. And uh, I looked like that. So that was interesting. Um, as far as the hardware was concerned, uh, there's a photo to the left of my passport there. Of, uh, it, it's from the original brochure. And it's actually featuring a guy called Andy West, who was my manager at the time, poor man. And you can see what the system looked like when it was assembled. Had uh, seven track and nine track tape drives. It had massive two and a half or even five megabyte DRI disk drives. Those are 14 inch round and brown as we used to call them. And up to 32 terminals, although most people didn't go beyond eight, otherwise it wouldn't run very quickly. It was uh, input was uh, to bootstrap this system. You use the switches on the front panel that you can see in the top photo there. And uh, I learned to program that in Octal. Uh, I, I, it took me a while, a couple of years before I learned about hex. So I was used to programming in 177777. And uh, you would load uh, uh, a word at the time uh, into, the, into the memory. It was core memory, which of course, keeps its memory even when you unplug it because it's magnetic core. 
So you key the bootloader in through the front panel uh, into core memory, and then you could take that core memory, unplug it from the computer on your, uh, on your workbench, plug it into another computer, and it would immediately start running the bootstrap. That then would allow it to, to load a program either from paper tape or from tape drive, um, or even, I guess, eventually from disk. And uh, yeah, it was interesting and exciting system for me to work on. The first mini computer that I'd really touched, I learned a huge amount. First of all, working as a bench technician, repairing the things at board level, and then subsequently as a systems engineer, um, testing them and doing QA on them. And then ultimately, as I said, helping install them in the field. The, um, the Redifon had this unusual business relationship with a company called Merrimat in Warsaw, where uh, they were licensed to, to produce the C-Check system, as it was called, in Poland for sale in Soviet bloc countries. And I had to help the guys in Merrimat understand the system, commission it, and then ultimately they were intending to, to make their own under license. So I tell you, for a, for a kid of whatever I was then, Hmm, 23, 20, yeah, 23. Um, going abroad to a Soviet bloc country, the first time I've ever been outside of England, in fact, and, uh, and dealing with the, uh, the interesting situation I found myself in, and I was there for several weeks, was uh, intriguing, to say the least. On my second visit, um, the people at Redifon had got my visa wrong, and it actually expired the day before I was due to leave to fly out from Warsaw Airport and the chap uh, at the uh, security desk in the airport, he, uh, he looked at my visa, he said, this is expired. And I, well, you can imagine my response, I was scared to death. And uh, then he said, okay, go, it's my tea break. He went off for a cup of tea and let me through. And it took me 30 years before I had the courage to go back to Warsaw and meet up with some of my friends that I made there in the seventies. Next, I moved on to working for Raytheon, not the defense contractor part of the company, which you'll be all used to hearing about, I'm sure, but something called Raytheon International Data Systems that was based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And again, it was uh, mini computers. In this case, it, Raytheon made their own PTS 1200s, and they were pretty powerful, as you can see from the spec on the screen there. 128k of ram memory uh, initially they had core memory but they switched to ram just as i joined them supporting up to 50 terminals um, using 3270 protocols for uh, pro for uh, communicating between the mini itself concentrators and then the desktop devices and they also had peripherals like boarding card printers of course the famous dot matrix printers and they had a massive 10 megabyte of DRI disk drives. Of course, I already knew the DRI product range from my engineering uh, experience at, at Redifon, so that was uh, an interesting move. I was uh, already partly trained for this. Ready, Raycheck was installed, sold to British Caledonian Airways at Gatwick as a beta site, um, which meant I'm sure that BKL got excellent prices from, from Raytheon. And I was stationed at Gatwick to, uh, to try and help them implement this system and kick the bugs out of it. Um, basically, before this, if you wanted to check in for an airline flight at, at Gatwick, um, the ground hostess or host would have a cardboard uh, design of the aircraft seat layout behind their head, and they would pop out physically a seat number and staple it to your boarding card so you knew what seat you'd got. So it was very mechanical, very hands-on. This was one of the first systems that automated that check-in process, at least in theory, and printed a boarding card complete with the seat number automatically for the passenger. Um, in that screenshot on the right, which is taken from an advertisement in, uh, in an airline magazine from the time, the left hand most photograph, the chap standing at the check in desk was actually my chum Clive, who worked for for uh, British Caledonian, and he was my liaison there, um, along with a guy called Peter Eek, who both worked for BCAL. So the computer room was uh, up above the uh, check in hall, 
in those days, Gatwick had just one terminal and one check-in hall, and uh, our computer room was up above it. And I spent many, 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 many hours in there um, debugging the thing, doing live debug in memory and uh, trying to keep the thing running. It was an uh, interesting, challenging time. Oh, and the Gatwick Express started then too. And British Caledonian had a check-in uh, above platform 13 at Victoria Station. And you could actually check in at Victoria Station, get your boarding pass, leave your baggage at the uh, Central London Air Terminal, known as CLAT, and you could get on the train down to, to Gatwick and you would go straight through airside and your baggage would follow you all being well, having been transported on the Gatwick Express and then transferred to your aircraft. Now, quite advanced stuff for those days and uh, I learned a lot. One of the things I learned was that in, uh, in rack mini computers, each slot is particular, the back plane would not be consistent all the way down. So some were memory slots, some were processor slots, some were IO slots. And if you do maintenance on one of those, take the boards out, clean them. And I tell you, at Victoria Station, they get full of soot, even though there were no longer steam trains, there was plenty of soot around for the fans to drag in. So you take them out and hoover them off. If you plug them back in the wrong slot, the outcome is not good. So I only made that mistake once. Now we jump ahead another three years and uh, I changed jobs. I worked for a company called Amplicon in Brighton and uh, it was actually run by the same guys who had run computing techniques when I was working on those analog digital hybrid systems. They started up their own company down in Hove uh, near Brighton and uh, they were selling to uh, industrial, uh, scientific and educational users they were selling a lot of data acquisition and process control systems. And most of them in those days were focused around the uh, HP, what they called the HP desktop calculator, which was really a, a, a microcomputer with Hewlett Packard written on it. And the interface between um, the Hewlett Packard controller and the devices was something called IEEE 488. Um, now, HP kit then was very expensive, and one of the guys at, uh, at, at Amplicon had figured out that a Commodore PET, for reasons best known to, I guess, Chuck Peddle, was uh, also fitted with an IEEE 488 port. So it was the only other little desktop computer that you could buy that could interface with some of this laboratory equipment. So because a Commodore PET even though it was, as I recall, something like six or 700 pounds at the time, even though it was uh, that sort of money, it was an awful lot cheaper than a Hewlett Packard equivalent. So um, they brought me in, I left uh, Raytheon, and they brought me into Amplicon to help them understand, because they were analog guys, help them understand how to program uh, a small desktop digital computer. Uh, to talk to these various uh, scientific devices. It wasn't a very sophisticated spec, as you can probably see. Dear old 8-bit 6502 processor, 4 or 8K of RAM, and uh, built-in Microsoft BASIC. Um, by the way, Microsoft BASIC is the first programming, second programming language I, I really learned at a high level, if you can call it that, up until uh, everything I'd done had been uh, straight off the front panel, in uh, in binary or sometimes in assembler so that was fun i i learned a lot doing that and uh, as you can see it was a pretty toy looking computer it had a tiny little plastic keyboard a bit like the early sinclair stuff and it had a built-in cassette recorder for program storage and data storage not long after a couple of years later commodore launched the 4000 series which had a full-size keyboard, woo even a numpad. Um, it came with uh, a, a better screen, a whole 80 characters wide instead of 40. Uh, it came with uh, an external dual floppy drive, five and a quarter inch floppy floppies, not the hard floppies. And uh, eight inch floppies were also available. And it also came with its own little matrix printer, although it's the usual, there were a ton of third party devices you could attach. 
And we sold a lot of these in, uh, from Bright for our offices in Brighton. Um, we had a little shop actually in Ditchling Road in Brighton. And uh, it got so busy in the early 80s that if I wanted a lunch break, because it was just me and the young lady who was helping me, if I wanted a lunch break, I had to lock the front door to stop people coming in trying to buy these things. And bear in mind the system you're looking at there, the computer was £895, the dual drive floppy disk was £895, and the printer was something like £695. So you're talking £2,000 worth of hardware there, and people were trying to break the door down to buy it in 1980, 81, 82. Fascinating stuff. Lastly, um, there's a, 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 an amusing story about hard drives for the Commodore PET. Because it used the IEEE 488 bus, it was possible to put uh, a decent speed external hard drive connected to it using that bus and a company based in uh, in Hove called Mator built uh, a, an external hard drive called the Mator Shark which connected through IEEE 488 uh, they were based in Hove as were we were in in Brighton so it was next door we went to visit them and it was run by a guy called an Irish guy called Tom Miskelly wonderful bloke and he told me that the company name Mator um, was Miss Kelly and the other reprobates, which was wonderful. They were in a little, little, I can't want to call it a factory. It was a two room office above an accountancy practice in Church Road Hove, where they built these things. Absolutely amazing, really good fun. Uh, then also in the early 80s, of course, IBM got on the scene. It was the first time IBM had ever built a computer from third party parts. Up until this point, every IBM computer was uh, was built by IBM right down to the silicon. This was a massive, massive change for them and was, was something they did in response to the, the growth of the desktop computer, you know, the Commodores, the Apples, and all the other desktop machines that started appearing in the mid to late 70s. They decided what they needed to do was get into that marketplace. So they designed the... Uh, the IBM PC using the Intel chips and uh, lots and lots and lots of other third party parts. It was uh, interesting times. Um, you might remember the days, the, the, the quote, which I've never checked whether it's true or not, that, uh, that Bill Gates said, why would anybody ever want more than 64K of memory? And uh, yeah, people still say things like that these days, I guess. It was IBM PC DOS, which as you probably know, was based on the, the DOS that Bill Gates wrote and sold to them. And uh, it was a, a pretty decent, you know, it was very well made in terms of mechanics. The keyboard was lovely. The hard drives, the, the floppy drives, pardon me, were built in. And of course it had a, a matching display. So it was a, a pretty device, but it had a way to go before really the software was there. It took a few years for it to catch up with Apple and in the UK, certainly with Commodore, who had uh, a significant lead in terms of applications that were available. So we were still selling Commodore pets uh, right through to the mid to late 80s. Um, Commodore, were, when they, they first appeared in the UK, by the way, um, had an office in, in central London. Uh, and uh, one of the guys who, uh, who worked there gave us this, uh, he was a very brave guy. He gave all the Commodore resellers, and in those days we were called dealers, but these days that would sound too much like drugs, wouldn't it? So we'll say resellers. Anyway, all the Commodore resellers are invited in for a demonstration of this new Apple machine, the Apple Lisa. And um, as it says, this was around 1983. And my goodness me, it was the worst demonstration I've ever seen in my life. It was so slow. It was horrendous. It was pretty expensive. I mean, the, the US price was, was nearly $10,000. And in the UK, it was approaching something similar. It was the first of the real proper graphics based uh, mini computer, micro computers, desktop computers, but it really never got anywhere just because it was just too unreliable and there was too much cheaper competition. But I remember having it demonstrated to me and being horrified by it, frankly. So just a quick overview of what I was playing with through the 1980s. 
Um, started with that PC, the one we saw just now. Then they brought out the XT, which incitingly had uh, only one floppy drive and it had a built-in hard drive. Wow, 10 megabytes, really huge. And of course, the IBM portable computer, uh, the PC Junior, the AT, which was, uh, which was a whole chip set up, the convertibles and so on. There was a lot of different versions. And in the late 80s, the PS2 range came out, which from an engineering point of view were a lot more difficult to work on. But uh, yeah, they were, uh, they were just dominating the marketplace, of course. The other thing that the IBM PC revolution did was it created a massive opportunity for what were called PC clones, as you'll probably remember. And some of those were, were just so famous in their own right, particularly the compact uh, so-called portable, which everybody referred to as the luggable. It was a really heavy baby. That's the one, the top left picture with the keyboard uh, unplugged from the front of it. Uh, I remember our accountants had one of those. I was just amazed at the fact that they were actually considering carrying it from office to office. It was a real ton. But it made for a, a whole bunch of, uh, of different businesses growing up on the back of the IBM specification. And of course, because it used uh, third party parts, it was, of course, uh, very easy for them to make something that ran just the same. And uh, we, at one time or another, I worked on um, repaired, sold, serviced, the uh, compact, the ACT Apricot from Birmingham, the Deck Rainbow, which uh, instead of a green and black screen had typically an orange and black screen, very sexy, um, a Tulip, which was uh, made in Crawley, and the Sirius Systems Victor 9000, famous for the fact that it had variable speed um, floppy drives so that you could get the same access time whether you were out at the edge of the disk or, or towards the center of the disk. And so, of course, some clever people would write software to spin that speed up and down and play music on it. Uh, there we are with electronic music again. And that was, that was lots and lots of fun. And the time I used to write reviews for the PC magazines and, and get my hands on all kinds of new kit and, and play with it and link them together and, and so on. Very entertaining times. Also in the early 80s, of course, the famous Commodore 64 came out, one of the, uh, the most popular, um, uh, if not the most popular uh, single computer uh, models of all time. And uh, we, of course, were Commodore dealers at Amplicon, so we started selling those as well. And uh, believe it or not, I got involved in games programming. I, uh, I hooked up with a guy called Dave Rota, a lovely guy who was a games designer. He actually had a, uh, one of these uh, little, you know, real world games, little toys and soldiers and what have you, a shop in, uh, in Victoria in London. And he came down to Brighton one day, found our computer shop, came in and, uh, and, and we got talking. And together uh, he did the, the design of the game itself and I did the programming. And uh, we had a couple of titles, Royal Boss and High Flyer, which uh, Commodore resold, um, allegedly. I'm not sure I saw more than about 10 quid's worth of royalties. And then Amplicon, uh, with my leadership, set up a, a games division called Brain Games, and we wrote some more software under that banner. But, uh, you know, it was, it was really um, old school role playing games computerized, not, uh, not the sort of games with quick reactions and joysticks. So they didn't sell very many, but it was fun and interesting to, uh, to write that software. Uh, I've still got the masters if anybody has a 64 and they'd like to have a go. Anyway, mid eighties. Well, one of the most important things for me in the mid eighties was getting involved in networking. Back in the 70s, when I worked for Raytheon, um, I'd learned a lot about local data communications using the 3270 uh, architecture and 3278 protocol. And I'd actually worked on what we would call today a packet sniffer, which would sit on the, uh, on the 3270 environment and show the data 
traveling backwards and forwards. And I always found that really fascinating. I loved doing that. So when the opportunity came in the, in the mid 1980s to start linking desktop computers together, um, I was really enthusiastic to do it. And I was lucky that the owners of Amplicon were very keen on technology themselves. And so they bought, um, I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, an IBM 36 for doing their accounts. Not, not the best decision in the world, in my opinion, but that's what they did. And then they had IBM PCs on everybody's desktop. And I was tasked with linking those together into a very early office network. So um, the first system that, that we played with was something called Taurus Tapestry. Taurus was uh, a company based in Cambridge in the UK who developed uh, an ethernet based network and a card to go with it for the, for the IBM PC. And uh, basically it was, um, it was peer to peer. There wasn't a central server, if you like, but there was a facility nonetheless to use their proprietary office mail system and file sharing, all that sort of stuff. And uh, for someone who was used to working on mini computer systems, things like word processors and, and, and internal email and so on were, were, had been the norm for me since the, since the 1970s. But in the 80s, it was really novel for, for PCs to be linked up that way. And Taurus for a while was a market leader with that. But um, they kind of got knocked out of the ring by Novell. And Novell were the dominant force for um, PC networking in uh, starting in the mid 80s um, with, uh, I think, Novell 2.1 was the first version I played with and then uh, Novell 286 and then Novell 386. Initially, they had their own dedicated server hardware with uh, Ethernet uh, output on the back, and you would link the, uh, the PCs to it with, uh, with proprietary Ethernet cards. And by the way, this is not the sort of uh, Ethernet you're used to seeing now with, uh, with uh, RJ45 connectors. It was uh, coaxial, like this uh, connector in the bottom left here, and uh, that's a BNC. All that was uh, was a standard for small local area networks. And of course, it had to flow. The cable flowed from one machine to the next as a, uh, a chain, if you like. So if anybody unplugged it, the whole network stopped because all the data fell out the end of the cable, of course. So that was uh, that was fun. And uh, the Novell system was superb. It really was excellent. They wrote their own server operating system that was optimized as a server optimated op operating system so it wasn't GUI it was a command line operating system so it didn't have any wasted processor messing about with user interfaces it was just there to share files and share print services and uh, you would stick a nice big fat hard drive in that uh, in that Novell server and connect all your PCs to it and it had all of the features that you'd expect from a PC-based uh, local area network server in that you had uh, full control over the, uh, the file permissions, which uh, they can, in, in the same way as you do if you look at a, how a, a Windows server works. You know, you've got cascaded folders, we would call them directories in those days, and you can set permissions at the directory level, or you can set permissions at the file level. You can use, you use groups to, to assign permissions rather than individual users. It works super well, and, uh, and it lasted a long time. Um, people were still enthusiastically buying Novell systems right through uh, the the nineties as well, so that was that was wonderful experience for me, and uh, of course IBM weren't to be left out. So in competition with the Ethernet local area networking system uh, using coax, they came up with uh, with their token ring system, and the the photo here on the bottom right is a token ring hub, 
And uh, basically, it's a ring in a star fashion, which caused a lot of people confusion and headaches. But basically, rather than having the data flowing down a single bus like it did with Ethernet, it would go around in, in a ring, in a circle. And access was controlled by a token, which, which continually rotated around that, that virtual ring. Uh, that meant that their performance was more predictable. And initially, it was faster. The first of the Ethernets were running at, uh, I have to get my orders of magnitude right, but I think one megabit. Yeah, and token ring was at four megabits, but then, uh, then, then Ethernet came out with 10 megabits and eclipsed it again. But token ring was very popular. We had uh, a, a lot of people, even after I started first base and moved into the 1990s, we still had plenty of clients out there who had token ring installed by default in their businesses, um, particularly in the banking sector, um, as opposed to Ethernet. So it was quite confusing if you if you were working as an engineer in terms of making sure you understood both systems and all the different operating systems that were at, at play. Um, this is just a bit more about NetWare. Uh, the other thing about NetWare is that it was um, it was um, quite uh, uh, relaxed. It wasn't just about supporting uh, supporting a, a PC and PC DOS. It also supported Mac, as you can see. MS DOS was pretty much the standard, but uh, when we move into the 90s, then Microsoft Windows became more popular, and so it would support that. So did OS2, um, so did Unix. Um, Novell owned Unixware, which was a, a flavor of Unix that they built based on SCO Unix, I think. And they also had their own DOS version as well. So you could have quite a mix sharing the same local area network. And I remember in the late 80s that uh, um, one of the biggest employers in Brighton was American Express, and they were buying uh, they were buying PCs and linking them together into local area networks even then. But the interesting thing for me was um, moving on just slightly forward towards the end of the 80s was when IBM themselves pushed the idea of linking these local area networks to their mid-range and mainframe systems as well. So there was a lot of comms technology involved in getting these ethernet connected pcs to talk to system 36s and the uh, the, the big system 370 mainframes so that was fun and eventually they would bring out um, ethernet tcp ip adapters for for the for the mainframe but initially um, there were converters that would hang on the back of the mainframe and allow it to talk on the on the ethernet network or the token ring network, of course, if it was IBM. So that was uh, that was interesting times. I learned a ton about data communications. That was set, really set me in a, a good path for what was to come next. So in 1989, um, the Amplicon, where I'd worked uh, for nearly 10 years, uh, the directors had a falling out, as they sometimes do in small companies. And uh, the MD, who, who was my, my immediate boss, uh, I was at the time, I was technical director. Um, he, uh, he was bought out of the company and the company changed direction and changed leadership. And lots of us didn't like that. Uh, I looked around for an alternative. I'd never expected to start my own business. That wasn't what I was into, but I couldn't find anywhere within easy striking distance where I could work on the, the sort of systems that I was enjoying and that I found satisfying. And um, without relocating somewhere else in the country, and my mother was quite old at that time and I was, although I'd left home, oh, thank goodness, I was still caring for her, so I didn't want to relocate. And I also wanted to have a, a decent amount of autonomy because I'd been spoiled at Amplicon. I'd had 10 years of quite a lot of autonomy. So in the end, I started my own company and it was called First Base. And uh, that was the original logo designed by a friend of mine, also based in Brighton. And in the early, early years of the First Base, like many small companies, 
got involved in all kinds of different technologies, um, but largely, nearly always focused on, on something to do with networking. And uh, one of the first clients we had was uh, one of the big uh, tobacco companies who had their, uh, their headquarters at uh, Weybridge in Surrey. And we, uh, my, my partner and I, my business partner and I uh, helped them set up a Novell network um, with partitioning between the departments and help them configure the security so that one department couldn't see the data belonging to another, which was you know, quite groundbreaking in those days. And then um, I was approached by uh, a PC reseller to do training on their behalf on, uh, on land manager or land mangler, as we used to call it which was a network operating system that uh, Microsoft developed uh, in cahoots with 3Com. And it sat on top of OS2, which was an operating system that was co-developed by IBM and Microsoft. So there was a lot of different players in this, and there was a lot of um, um, debate between IBM and Microsoft on this until in the end, um, they came to a settlement and Microsoft owned it. So, Land Manager uh, was, was surprisingly popular. It was horrendously difficult to, to work with, um, pretty slow because it was far too, I hated it because it was all graphical user interface, which I felt was unnecessary on a server when I was so used to NetWare, which was just command line, slim, fast. And honestly, I did a benchmark test and that manager was 11 times slower, but there you go. Anyway, it seemed to me that that's the way it was going. And it, land manager sort of set the scene for what eventually became Windows NT Advanced Server or Windows NT 3.1, I think, originally. Anyway, um, I was delivering this training for end users so that at a departmental level, some poor person would be given the task of managing the server for that department, not the IT department, who was still, after all, mainframe specialists, but just ordinary users who'd been who pulled the short straw and had to look after the departmental server. And uh, so the biggest customer for this, the biggest client for this training was Glaxo Pharmaceuticals. And when the reseller that I was contracting to went bust, that was just a great opportunity in the end. Um, I lost a month's income because they went bust, but I decided, well, actually my business partner, Kim, and I decided together, let's just go to Glaxo and say to them, look, I'm the guy that's been doing the training. That, that reseller's gone bust, but I can come and do it directly for you. And they said yes, which was fantastic. So my day rate went up seven times seven times a day rate because I didn't have the middleman and that really launched first base. I did a lot of work for Glaxo on the back of that until they merged with Welcome and part of the merger deal was cost savings and part of the cost savings was cutting training. On another topic in the 90s, um, that's when really the mid 90s, the, uh, the internet arrived in Brighton. I was obsessed. I really wanted to play with this. I'd been using um, early internet connectivity from about the late 80s, um, you know, before the web existed, um, playing at a, at a command line level um, with, with all kinds of different protocols that I won't bore you with now, and you'll remember or you won't, depending on whether you were there. But um, the, the crime author, Peter James, it turns out, was one of the people that funded the first internet service provider in Brighton, which was called Pavilion Internet. And Pavilion Internet were the, uh, the first people with internet connectivity in Brighton, and therefore the first people that I wanted to talk to so that I could get internet and web access. And uh, I spent an awful lot of time in Pavilion's offices learning about this and, and using very sophisticated interfaces like Mosaic Netscape, remember that? And uh, yeah, what I didn't know until just recently is that uh, it was Peter James who, who put up, with, with some friends of his, put up the money to get Pavilion Internet going in the first place and provided Brighton with its first ISP. 
So once the internet really started to become popular because it was graphical, people had the facility to do email, people had the facility to build websites, then of course, businesses started to, to look at that because why wouldn't you? It's, uh, it's, it's a whole new opportunity and maybe it can, can help the business grow. And at the time, um, the most popular conference on, on computer security was uh, called CompSec. And that ran at the QE2 Centre in London for many years before Info Security Europe was thought of. And I got involved. I looked back through my, through my records and found these paper abstracts that, that were there. So in 1995s, I was talking about the security implications of moving from Novell Netware to, uh, to Land Manager, for example. Um, in 96, I was talking about this weird thing somebody had invented called an intranet. Nobody knew what that meant. What's an intranet? I guess nobody talks about intranets anymore either. But for a while, there was a big panic about whether it was safe to run your own websites in-house. Um, in 97, we'd started talking about NT Server. And that's where, you know, this was a Betamax VHS battle, uh, if you know what that means. And uh, it, in this case, NT was the VHS. NT won the battle. And having been designed, NT, you may know, was designed from the ground up by the guy who worked on DEX operating systems. So it was a brand new build, but the principles and a lot of the layers on top um, were, were the same as Land Manager. And that gave me a real leg up into that world. And of course, one of the first things we did, um, running training courses and giving, giving uh, talks at conferences and so on, was helping auditors understand what this new technology looked like, what was secure and what was not secure, how should it be configured to, to, to safeguard the information that people were increasingly putting on these systems. And uh, yeah, back in 97, also I gave a paper on internet email security, which, uh, which is still not solved really, is it? And also we were invited by the BSI to run a series of, uh, of, of training courses for businesses around the UK on this new thing they'd invented called BS7799. Um, in fact, uh, I, was, I was involved in the original DTI paper, um, which became BS7799, which became today ISO 27000 um, by, uh, by Glaxo. They, they'd had a, a security incident and some bright spark there had spotted this, this um, document published by the Department of Trade and Industry, as it was then, um, which was uh, a set of standards for secure computing, if you will, or information security, as we began to call it. And that became BS7799. And we worked very closely with the BSI to help explain to medium-sized businesses around the UK why they should consider adopting uh, a, a standard for information security. And my goodness, it was an uphill battle. And I really thought that, uh, that the information security management system idea was going to fail. It, it didn't, of course. It just took a long time for people to really get into it and, and adopt it. But that taught me loads about how to do uh, threat and risk assessment, how to proceduralize security. So that it wasn't just about technology, of course, but understood how it was about process and procedure and people. So by the late 90s, we'd started running a whole bunch of training courses. We, we got in, uh, in, in cahoots with a local hotel that um, had excellent facilities here in the deepest West Sussex, including um, very posh carvery lunches. It was very popular locally for people to take their parents out on the weekend for dinner. And I thought, what a great idea if we were to run these training courses for people, usually for auditors, to come down to Sussex. They could stay at this hotel. We could teach them a one day or a two day or a three day course. And we could throw in a really lovely lunch and everybody wins. 
and it really worked. It was fantastically popular. We had some people who would who had come to every course that we ran, I think. And uh, of course, it, it really put first base on the map as far as the audit and security community was concerned, because people didn't know how to do NT security properly and how to audit uh, that environment for the, the, the best and most secure configuration. They didn't know how to, how to configure firewalls. We actually ran courses uh, in, in, uh, in cooperation with Sophos for their customer base on how to configure firewalls securely and how to test those firewalls and so on and so on. And these, these training courses really put first base on the map. And we still, at the time that we sold first base in 1998, uh, 1998, 2018, one of the problems with age is losing track of the decades. Yeah, 2018. And by that time, we still had clients who we'd first met back in 1996, 97, 98, um, who'd come on our training courses and had become friends as well as clients. That was uh, a, a good time for me. And uh, I learned so much developing these training courses. And then, of course, we developed our penetration testing methodologies. We developed social engineering methodologies. We, we set the foundations in place for, for, for our understanding of red teaming and blue teaming. And over that period of 1998 to 2018, we, we grew first base from, uh, from a, a, a three or four person company full of enthusiasm and, and, and bright eyed and bushy tailed internet and, and a networking company into, uh, into the security company that it became. And so for, for 18 years, I was CEO of, of First Base, which had become First Base Technologies and focused almost exclusively on cybersecurity and, and very much dominating uh, in the penetration testing world, the social engineering world, and then latterly in red teaming. And uh, I had the privilege of, of working with some great people, some, some wonderful colleagues and friends that I made over that 18 years. And uh, of course, an equally great number of, of, of wonderful clients. So come 2018, my wife Didi and I had been running that company together, that rebirth of first base, if you like, for, for that 18 years together. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be married to someone who's not only a brilliant technical person, but also an accountant and a lawyer as well. So she's pretty clever. And uh, together we grew the business to a size that was attractive to, to be sold. And uh, in theory, at least in 2018, we decided to retire, which I did for two years. And then I got bored. And so I founded Naturally Cyber, which is uh, a much, uh, much smaller and more humble uh, uh, offering, really. It's primarily me and uh, occasionally uh, cross-fertilization with a few other people where I've limited my, my activities to, to calling on that, those decades of experience and hopefully help a, a few businesses to be more secure. Phew. Okay, well, I, I talk nonstop for, I don't know, 50, 55 minutes, something like that. So uh, at this point, I think, I'm going to stop my screen share and uh, let's see who's asking a few questions. So we've got quite a lot of comments in there. If you'd like to speak as well, then put your hand up and we can unmute you. My goodness me, I have a, a disturbing number of comments here. That's fascinating, isn't it? Um, so the lovely John Mitchell, hello, John. Uh, his first machine was in 1968, a CDC 3200 with 32K of RAM. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating how those of us who've been around that long have so many things in common. Uh, oh, Tallulah says it was possible in 1963 in those phone boxes to use the engineer's number to phone long distance for Tuttons, saying for a friend. <laughs> yes, I never discovered that. I, I think I was possibly brought up to be too honest. 
Yeah, phone freaking like you make calls to nothing. This is all true. Uh, Will says, I started with the pets in the late 72, learned to assemble on them. First proper job was working with IBM PC 1Gs. Facts 11 750s. Wow, excellent. <laughs> Great. Pete, you have a lot of comments from Amanda as well. Okay. Well, you wanna, do you want to jump in and, and sort out a few... Uh, a few a few questions for me. It's mostly comments at the moment, and everybody's okay. reminiscing. <laughs> oh, there's Alex Thompson. Hello, Alex. Nice to see you. My goodness me, we worked together through the eighties at Amplica. <laughs> I believe he's in North America now. There you go. The wonders of the internet. Well, Jamie Peace has just popped up as well. He gave a very good talk on uh, mainframes. Uh, the major <laughs> and IBM mainframes. <laughs> the mainframe, my favourite computer. Quite right, Jamie. I understand. <laughs> oh, Rob, Rob Lockwood asked, when did I start being the bad guy? When I, okay, well, there is a little story around that. If you want it, I guess we've got time. Um, I don't want to go into, let's, let's just summarise it. Um, I wasn't happy at school, in, in my senior school at all. There were lots of good reasons for that, but I wasn't. So I used to play truant quite a lot. And rather than, um, I guess, well, the short and long of it is that um, I used to make up a story um, about what I was doing and why I wasn't at school. Not for my parents because, um, well, my father was dead, but not for my mother. So instead I used to go hitchhiking around Sussex, which is pretty scary really in today's world, but it, I mostly got away with it in the, in the uh, 1960s. So I would, I would pretend that I was going exploring for Roman remains and ancient British barrows and so on. And I would, I would occasionally um, call upon a little old lady to give me a free cup of tea and a piece of cake by telling her this fabrication about how I was on a school trip when in fact I was just skiving off. And I think that ability to make up stories and do social engineering that I developed as a young teenager probably set me in good stead for, for doing the same thing as an adult and getting paid for it. But the first time I, I really got involved in in simulating criminal attacks um, would be in 1996 for uh, a small bank when they asked us to uh, to attempt to break through the firewall. What else? Oh, Brian M's got a question. You've re reviewed the past 40 years. Looking forward to another 40 years. What do you think computing will look like? <laughs> so you're just asking me to build Bill Gates again. And I'll never see why anybody should need more than, than, than 32 gigabytes of RAM. I think uh, <laughs> what I'd like it to look like, which is going to horrify some people, I suppose, is uh, embedded computing. I'd love to have an internet connection in my head. That would make life so much easier. As you get older and you can't remember faces and you can't remember names, imagine just having LinkedIn just plugged into your brain. That would be outstanding. But um, maybe not. Maybe there's a few downsides to that as well. I'm not sure how well my cranial firewall would work. But I do think, I do think, you know, there's, there's a, a book I just bought, which I haven't started reading yet, which talks about um, how... Uh, artificial intelligence will not be a threat, but be the next, um, be like human beings' children. And, and <laughs> 40 years probably isn't long enough for that. But I do think, I do think it's nearly impossible to predict. Uh, no, I'm not even going to go there. Oh, okay, I, Amanda has got a question. Um, I've unmuted yeah. your microphone, Amanda. It's a little bit quiet. Is that better? I've got my volume on full now, so I can hear it. Sorry, I just, I just got a question. I wanted to thank you very much. Amanda, just come a little bit closer to your microphone. Uh, uh, 
I, I am really close to my microphone. Are she saying she doesn't have a question, but she'd like to thank you for your excellent presentation? Uh, no, I wanted to. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, I actually wanted to thank you for something else. My father, who died January 2020, always told a story that he was asked to invite um, to invest in this fruit thing. And he said, I don't know, they invented it in the back of a shed and I don't think it will go anywhere. And then you were talking about Apple in the UK and you've just confirmed my father's story. So I wanted to thank you for that very, very much. Oh, bless you. Excellent. Thank you. No, I, I wish I could tell him. <laughs> so thank yeah. you very much for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so Will has got his hand up so we can unmute Will. Hello, Pete. It's been a very long time. It's been longer than I would like. Um, but we share a lot of early experiences. And what I'm really interested in is your experience in integrating 3270 and IP-based networks back in the late 80s, early 90s, and how you found that. Because for me, it was ouch. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's a, a very fair description, I think. Um, IBM got uh, uh, put a, a, a program together called System Center Academy, which was meant to take the brightest and best of the reseller companies and educate them on how to do things like that. Because it was IBM, probably 50% of that academy was actually about how to sell things, which wasn't exactly what I needed. Um, but as I recall, and my memory's a bit a bit dim from those days. Um, oh, that's very understandable because mine is too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I won't talk about the sixties and the predisposition I had to, into the seventies to cause my brain not to work so well. But um, I think I think that I'm fairly certain they had a concentrator box of some sort. And as I recall, they did if, indeed. I I if I tell you the truth, I don't think I ever got it to work. I remember the concentrator boxes because we had them. And it was possible to get them to work, but it was a nightmare. You, every single installation was different. Sounds, and, sounds, sounds typical. And I, I distinctly remember, I was working at the time for... Um, should we say a large government installation not too far from where you started? <laughs> <laughs> so you know which one. Indeed. Literally just down the coast. Yeah. And some of them would work perfectly. And then we'd do another wing, and it just didn't want to talk. And we, we obviously had we had a mixture of Novell. IBM and 3270 networks at the time. So, and most mostly on thick net, on token ring, on thick ethernet. <laughs> oh, good God. All right. Okay, we've got big backlog of questions now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, I just got an interesting. Can I pick, pick a couple? Yeah. Um, what, what's your take on Windows NT and security? Why it came in? so insecure relative to our other, other OSs. I don't think that, although Windows itself, I think it's because Microsoft tried to be backwards compatible with everything. And because it was designed as a standalone desktop operating system, um, ever since Windows 1, basically, they've been trying to make things backwards compatible and they never got a proper handle on the key features of a network operating system. I mean, even today, as far as I know, unless you add third party products in, if you log into a Windows network, it doesn't tell you when you last logged in. It doesn't tell you where you last logged in from and all those sorts of things. It's, it's you know, I can say this, I don't care. And I'm sorry if Microsoft are listening. I still don't think Windows is fit for purpose in a network environment. I just don't. And everybody has to bodge it and add other software and so on to try and make it, make it uh, secure. But the, the problem is, you know, you compare it with 
something as elegant as one of the Unix environments. It's, it's so clean and easy to use. You don't have all this ridiculous registry rubbish that nobody, nobody understands. And you can make it secure comparatively easily. I, I think it's a closed shop mentality that Microsoft came up with with Windows, which was still eating the, the, the app, was still eating the, the problems from that. What else have I got here? Oh, I wonder you weren't arrested when you arrived in Poland with that hair. I tell you what, I, I've got one worse on that. Um, because Redifon, and I, I think, although they're probably still around some of those guys, but I'll say it anyway, because who cares? Um, they, they, they were having problems getting spares into Poland, unsurprisingly. So they are, in my naivety, I was 23, I'd never been abroad, I didn't know what customs was or anything. They, they asked me to take a suitcase full of spares with me as my, as my hold luggage, which I did. And despite everything, you'd think it would have been really horrendous as people waving guns about, you know, the customs guys were soldiers, the passport guys were soldiers, but actually they didn't care. You know, they weren't really, they just wanted to, to, to finish their shift and go home, I think. And uh, certainly going in and out of the country was, was never much of a challenge. In terms of being in Poland, I think I was very lucky to make some really great friends at, uh, at Merrimack, one of whom I'm still friends with today. And uh, they kind of helped me stay under the radar, I think. One funny story is this, I was staying in the official hotel and I was bored crazy. And the only entertainment in the room was an old valve radio. And being an old style radio, it had medium wave, long wave and short wave. I wanted to listen to short wave radio so I could pick up Voice of America and hear an English or sort of English voice. Um, so I disconnected the main flex from the bedside light and strung it up across the bedroom as an aerial and picked up shortwave radio. I was surprised they didn't arrest me for that. <laughs> but they didn't. Oh, somebody says, working in Soviet bloc countries, did you run into the US Department of Defense barriers on non-proliferation of tech? Uh, yes. Um, for some reason, Redifon had got this special deal with Merrimack, which was approved by everybody. But uh, I think it was a, a cross-marketing deal. Um, for some reason, we were we were okay, or, or Redifon, not me. I was just a just a gopher. Were okay to, to to move the kit into Poland and to allow them to to build our own versions of uh, of CJEC. Um, and in return, we have to take some of their line printers, which were awful. But no, it, it wasn't a problem. The only, the only interface I had with the US DOD was in the uh, British Embassy on Sundays. They used to have the British Embassy Club where you could go for like a full English breakfast and uh, pretend you weren't in Poland, which I did occasionally, although I really enjoyed being in Poland. Um, and uh, one day there was a US Marine in there. He took one look at me and my haircut and punched the wall in order to scare me, which worked really well, so I ran away. Um, Jamie has his hand up, so I'm just going to unmute Jamie. Hello. Yes, hi, Peter. I'm the, I'm the mainframe guy, and um, I, I, th I thought your presentation was excellent, so thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in the era of dumb terminals, and... Um, just listening to sort of some of the announcements recently, like from Microsoft, um, who had announced a Windows 365, and you know, all you hear about now is like cloud computing. And I wonder if we, in your opinion, do you think we're going back sort of full circle to sort of the where we'll just have dumb terminals again and kind of all the computing power will be somewhere else? <laughs> I wish, I wish, no, I don't think so, because <laughs> I think you know, that these young people. They use these things now. You yes. Know, that I think uh, what's interesting is I think that we've moved to where the it's a done terminal from a data perspective, but not from a processing perspective. I think that's the different that's a different model we're in, isn't it? That there's tons of processing power in in the individual's hand, but the data all lives somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. Which is pretty, I mean, it's like worst of all worlds, really, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we've got a question from JBB. What are your thoughts on the Internet of Things? 
Oh, I've been playing with that so much. Yeah, I sort of alluded to the fact that I've worked quite a lot with what we today would call operational technology. With I remember uh, we used an Apple III as uh, as as a controller Went back in the eighties in in Amplicon, playing with connecting to, to to various interesting devices. Anyway, um, the answer is it's a nightmare. And <laughs> got, we've set up being us, Didi and I have got two separate, well, we've got three separate networks at home. And one of them is just for playing with and it has all the IoT devices on it. Last time I looked, there were 60 or 70 on there, just so we can play with them and see see what we think. Um, I, I, we've had a few, uh, a, a few webinars on the topic of IoT through various bodies that I'm involved with. And um, some of the really clever people, not me, some of the really clever people who, who work in that area and talked about it um, are largely scared to death. And I don't think there's a short term solution to making the IoT environment secure. But it's, it's clearly yet another wild west that the criminals can play in and do terrible things with. And until there's some really serious outcome, I, you know, I don't think government legislation is really viable because people are buying stuff for five quid from their favourite retailer that's made who knows where. They've got no idea what security means or or how to make it safe or even that they should. So um, I think, you know, all we can, as professionals, all we can do is, is try and segregate it or isolate it in a commercial environment and in our own networks. And... Uh, let the rest of them get on with it, I'm afraid. It's, it's going to get worse before it gets better, I'm certain. OK, Will has got his hand up, so I'm going to unmute. Yeah, Pete, um, this is more in our old school mid, with the security side of things. Um, ransomware as a service and malware as a service, how do you feel that we can deal with this threat? I think that... The, it, I, was, I was reading something that popped into my mailbox just yesterday, I think, where the, the, the insurance claims have gone down significantly recently. And the, the contention was that, that that's a combination of the effort people have been putting into to actually finding the keys for people and unlocking it. And, and part of it um, from the insurance companies negotiating on the claimant's behalf. Um, Honestly, I think there's realistically in working within the current legal frameworks, um, the best thing we can do is educate, particularly the smaller businesses, but really some of the biggest ones as well, and the home consumer, to make offline backups because everything's become online, it's permanently plugged in, and, and clever ransomware will just find its way around the network and pollute everything, even the backups. So that, you know, the principle of what we do, by the way, uh, something we started doing at first base, oh, I don't know, it must be seven years ago now, is, is taking an optical media backup of, of stuff on a regular basis so that, we, you know, it's right only. And I'm sure there's something similar one could achieve in, uh, in businesses. But my view is the best, the best response is to have up-to-date, non-pollutable backups. But that's, that's exactly what I do for yeah. our customers it's 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 educating them to change the freaking drives every couple of days that's hard yes it's hard it is hard but i think you know there's there's obviously there's you know there's a move towards uh, attempt attempting to make hack back legitimate for the right for the right actors and and to be able to, but honestly i think as you say it's it's as a service, it's proliferate enormously. Uh, I, I don't see there's, there's much in the way of defence and much better off focusing on mitigation. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, we've got one last question now from Maureen. What do you think of Virgin's proposals to have a national database? What do I think of whose proposals for national database? Um, Virgin, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, right. Um, I'm terrified of national databases. 
But, you know, when you've worked in security as, as, as we have for 30 of the last 50 years, I think you, you just know it's got to be a trade-off, hasn't it, between, between benefits and risk. I mean, I've got a few medical challenges at the moment now I'm ageing and I'm very comfortable sharing and allowing my, my data to be shared between practitioners and between the various services. Um, but I think a, a national... Does, does, does any government really have a great track record of protecting data? Um, probably not. So um, I guess that those sorts of moves are going to be inevitable. But my, you know, I, I, I try and avoid politics. But what I will say is I think there's a, there's a, at the moment, we're going through a phase of populist politics in a lot of countries. And that tends to, to move towards a, a more of a sort of police state mindset a little bit. And I think anything that we can do to, to make that more difficult, as if, if we're libertarians, it's probably a good idea. So, no, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, I think we move over to Dalim now, who's going to tell us about uh, our next event. Yes, indeed. But before that, let me just echo what a lot of people have said, Pete. That was really wonderful. It was a great walk down memory lane, along with a lot of memories that people didn't even remember they had. So that was re really uh, such a good occasion to bring together a whole lot of us seniors, the people with the gray hair or no hair, and the people who proliferate in our world and got it to where we are now. And you, in a sense, Peter, are an example of that. So thank you. Now, what we wanted to do, of course, is to encourage students to come to this event, and we've succeeded in that, that huge numbers of older people here. So thank you very much for attending. And just to let you know that Central and North London uh, branches have put, have put together a seniors initiative, and Maureen, who is on this call, is the lead of that. And what we will do is encourage more face-to-face -face get, get to them. I've been trying to do that at BCS London, but fairly soon I think we'll be able to open up for limited numbers of people for tea and talk in the afternoon. And um, maybe we listen to a webinar in the background or whatever. But that I would like to see happening from September. So please do tune in to what we're doing Come and support us, come and meet other seniors and benefit from this wealth of experience that we've been hearing so much about today. Okay, well, that's on the uh, front of seniors and what we've been hearing today. I hope you'll join me in giving Pete our great thanks for another tremendous presentation, Pete. And um, make the most of his music as well when you get the chance, but mostly let make use of our wealth of experience to benefit other people. And in terms of those other people, we've got something coming up on Monday, the 9th of August, if you can see my screen. And that is very much for careers and what comes next. What's hot, what's not. And the views are expressed by director at Harvey Nash Group, the uh, marketing director, in fact, Rob, and also Rona, who's an MD in Harvey Nash, UK, in, based in Scotland. And they have the benefit of a survey Harvey Nash has done of about 6,000 people. And um, we'll see what is important in our world today and a bit of tomorrow as well. So please do sign up and come on Monday, the 9th of August, and keep watching this space for other great things. But meanwhile, again, huge applause to you, Pete. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. You're welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. And I just, See you put, next a, time. <laughs> I just put a note on the chat saying, if anybody, I'm sorry I couldn't respond to everybody. I've put my email address in the chat if anybody wants to contact me directly. Fantastic. Very generous of you. Thank you. And everyone, please do. Keep getting together and let's keep talking 
let's hope we can meet again soon. All the best for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye.